princesses embarks upon a devious scheme to get Calvus out of the way so he can take Vipsania for himself. Calvus is tried on a trumped-up charge of treason and found guilty. Almost two millennia later, in modern-day St Albans, there is a grisly discovery in Verulamium Park. An Australian-born detective, Chris O'Rourke, is the investigating officer. A crucified body, ancient coffins, 2,000-year-old skeletons, Latin writings and an old pair of sandals. It's an investigation that baffles even the tenacious O'Rourke. In a story that spans three continents and 2,000 years, what he eventually discovers is about to send shockwaves around the globe. I will just read two short excerpts, one from the first chapter where the setting is Verulamium Park in modern day St Albans, the other from the second chapter uh, set in Jerusalem in the first century. And if you want to know what happens in the 2,000 years in between, I'm sorry, you've got to buy the book. <laughs> Just be a short reading from each section. Like the this is St Albans today. Like the doomed rabbit that can't help but stare into the headlight of the car about to run him down, PC Dennis Coste looked up once again, unable to help himself, and then promptly lost his battle to hang on to the contents of his stomach, spraying his colleague with bits of regurgitated kebab. I hope everyone's finished their breakfast. <laughs> Costain had been at the Hertfordshire Constabulary for a mere 13 days and had dreaded seeing his first dead body. At training college he'd learned he'd been warned what to expect. Morbid pathologists who wouldn't be out of place in a black and white Frankenstein movie, carving up cadavers with the casualness of a butcher trimming a side of beef. Corpses without limbs, some even headless, mangled in hot horrific road accidents. Faces of suicide victims blown away by a shotgun blast. The boys from forensics sorting out the pellets from bits of brain hanging from the ceiling. But this scene transcended those bedtime stories and deposited him in the land where nightmares are born. For heaven's sake, then, his colleague said, hope popping quickly out of the line of fire. Watch where you're spraying that stuff. You'll have me doing it next. Not that that was likely. PC Karen Tucky had been in the force seven years and had seen more than their fair share of mangled bodies though she had to admit she'd never seen anything quite like this one. Costain which wished CID would arrive and take over. It seemed as though he radiated an hour ago, though in reality it was only a matter of ten minutes. They'd been called to the scene, a copse in Verulamium Park, by the ruins of the southern wall of the ancient Roman city, after an anonymous caller phoned the station. No doubt later the detectives would try to ascertain who'd made the call, Four o'clock on a bitterly cold April morning was a strange time for someone to be wandering around the park, unless it was the perpetrator. Wonder who the hell he was, Tucky said, appearing to address the corpse. Costin held his stomach as if that would prevent more embarrassing vomitous projectiles and glanced up at the corpse, instantly wondering why he needed to take another look. The image would be with him until the day he died. It was male, Mediterranean appearance, perhaps in his early forties, well built with black tightly curled hair. He was naked which somehow rendered the scene a touch more gruesome. His injuries were severe. There were numerous small cuts and excessive bruising all over the body. But that wasn't the worst of it. Costain's first body was nailed to a cross. Skipping back 2,000 years to Jerusalem, Judea, it's three o'clock in the afternoon on Friday the 7th of April and the year is 30. Gliding with a grace reserved for angels, a lone steppe eagle crossed out of the Kidron Valley and continued his journey northwest. A southerly breeze, the calm exhalation of an invisible gentle giant helped him on his way. The afternoon sun spilt a hint of sheen onto the dark brown plumes of his outstretched wings, and it was though he knew there was an air of majesty about him. He'd been searching for food, a task really beneath his station, where instinct told him there may be some ahead, for he'd been here before. But as he crossed the southeastern walls of the city, his senses sharpened, as if to remind him that cities can harbour danger as well as sustenance. There was something different about the place this time, strange, eerie, which encouraged him to keep moving, to continue his search for food elsewhere. Suddenly the clear blue sky darkened, the breeze freshened and warmed, metamorphosing into a hot wind, he felt himself being whipped by thousands of minute particles of sand. Passing over the northwestern walls, he saw some high ground. He knew this place too. 
It was less crowded, less noisy, and there were some poles where he'd rested in the past. He could wait here until the sandstorm passed. As he glided downwards towards the poles, instinct kicked in again and he quickly veered away. Now he sensed danger, but at the same time he was driven by morbid curiosity. He found a tree away from all the activity and he settled there. Soon the storm would pass and he could continue his hunt for food. In the meantime, he would remain vigilant, placing more trust in his instinct than in those he saw below. Um, unlike the election which I self-published, Kelvis is published by a publisher and I managed to secure a, uh, uh, that deal uh, following uh, winning a uh, competition uh, by submitting a manuscript to that publisher. Um, if you're interested in buying a copy, uh, see me after uh, the election. I do have a few copies of those left. Um, it's $15. Uh, Kelvis is 25 as a new release. If you are electronically inclined, both are available as a Kindle download, and Kelvis you can get from iTunes as well. Um, if you'd like to just think about it, I have some bookmarks to give away, and uh, they have the publisher's website address. I also have cards with my contact details on them. Thank you very, very much. Um, Patrick, I've just time for a couple of questions. It's a very yes. fascinating presentation. Anyone? Right, Jim, first. And, uh, I was just going to say, um, I'm all for the e-commerce and stuff like that, but when it comes to reading a book, I still enjoy to read a, a hard copy book yeah. at, at night. Have you found that that's sort of the, the way most people are with literature? I think saying? it depends on age a bit. Yeah. Um, I'm a read on the iPad every night yeah. because it's bigger font, there's light, and I don't need my glasses. Yeah, I, I have to tell you that <laughs> it's easy. I can add you a uh, Some years ago, I swore I'd never had a mobile phone, and such as my uh, <coughs> antipathy towards uh, electronics, but of course I can't do without one now. Um, and then when you, you could buy a Kindle, I said, I'll never have a Kindle, I'd just like to read a book, you know. Uh, now I have a Kindle. Um, I can't buy a book. You know, I, I, I just I can just lie in bed and read it, and when I finish it, I can just click a button and download another one from Amazon. I'm just lying in bed at ten o'clock yeah. at night. So, uh, and, and they're cheaper, of course. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm a bit sold on on electronic media too. It's great. One, one, one more question. <laughs> it made you um, really going with competition, competition, or is it, is there was it a local competition? Or, I, mean, uh, I happened to be at a seminar and I just picked up a brochure. Uh, if you're a writer, especially a budding one, you know, trying to make it get into it, um, you usually pick up those things all over the place and you, know, you just submit manuscripts left, right and centre and I just happened to submit this one to that publisher and it was accepted. So. And the other second question, that, how, how many more manuscripts have you got in part? I've got... I've got uh, I've written seven books all told. The first one I just finished it to prove I could do it and threw it away. I didn't think it was good enough to really get published. Um, I've just finished another one. I'm just working on the research for another another one, which would be a much bigger book and much more in depth, I think. But um, yeah, I, I, I just love doing it, you know. It's, it's, and, and what genre are you? Uh, Lead awards or beat awards? Well, awards. I, I write thrillers um, uh, because I read thrillers and they say you should write, write what you read. Uh, there's no, no use doing, me a mil, uh, doing a Mills and Dean book if I would see you imagine you're writing <laughs> I think we, I've got to wind it up, guys, because I've got the sergeant's got to do some work. But Michael Parkinson. <laughs> and Tony's got to say a couple of words too before he goes. Uh, yeah. Could you uh, thank our, our guest speaker, please? Yeah, well, Darrell, that was a very interesting talk, and um, uh, we really do appreciate you coming along and speaking this morning, and, um, and we'd love to present you with um, this um, small token. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.